Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? Say it for me. Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do we believe, church, do we believe these words to be true? Yes. Do we believe that we don't need to be afraid? That we don't need to be discouraged? Uh, because God is with us. The God who created the universe is with you and with me. And he's with us here today through his Holy Spirit. And as believers gather together, Jesus says he, he'll be there with us too. So I don't know about you, but uh, when I realize how good and strong and mighty God is, uh, I'm a little less afraid. So let's say some things that we might be afraid of today. And, and you can say it, what other people are afraid of today. What are some things, just, just say a word out loud. What are things people are afraid of? The yeah. virus. Virus, okay. What else? Rejection. Rejection. Boss. Many things that we would say about it. As our kids go to children's church, we want to bless them. We want to bless them with these words. Kids, you are dismissed. We have to go. And the church is going to say this together over you, because this is my hope for these kids. That they'll grow to be strong young men and young women. Not out of their own strength, but out of the strength of the Lord. So let's say it together. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You know, um, that was kind of a depressing sound. <laughs> you can do better than that. Let's say it like we mean it to our kids as they go on. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And then you may remain standing and see and sit if you like.
Good morning. Good morning. I want to invite you guys to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, one of my favorite verse, chapters in the entire Bible. Uh, and you probably heard me say that a bunch, but Ephesians <laughs> 6 is so, so good. So, so good. Ephesians 5 is where it says, wives submit to your husbands. So that's not my favorite chapter. My favorite chapter is Ephesians 6. It also says, husbands submit to your wives as, and love the wi your wives as the ch uh, Christ loved the church. So in case you're thinking, Chris, where are you going with that? Don't worry. That was just a, that was a freebie. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we've been talking, friends, about first steps. And as we talked about these first steps, it's what does a Christian need to learn? What does a Christian need to do in the very beginning stages of their walk of faith? And as we've looked at that, we've talked for many months about it. And now we're talking about practices that we do. We're not talking about the core heart that the Holy Spirit gives a Christian that we need to make sure is there and growing and developing. These are the practices, these are the outward actions that we do. And these are things that change the world, friends. These are things that change our world. Um, they, they increase our connection with Jesus, and they impact the world in profoundly good ways. And I can't say that enough. You know, the Bible has things that it wants us to do, and every one of those things are things that impact the world for his kingdom and transform our relationship with Jesus to something greater than it was before. So God has a lot of things for us to do, but those things are good and powerful things. So we've talked specifically about one practice, and that one practice we've talked about is prayer. prayer. Yeah, thank you. We've talked about prayer. Talking to and listening to God. Talking to and listening to God. That's what prayer is all about. Taking time away from the world to enter into the courts of heaven, to go before your Father, and, and then as you do that, pray for specific things, and then even as you ease out of that prayer, and you are preparing to go right back into this crazy world that we live in. And I don't know if you know, but the world we live in is kind of crazy right now. So Jesus says, when you pray, go to your home, go to your room, close the door behind you so that nobody's around you, nobody sees you, so you can pray in secret, and then these are some of the words that he says to pray. The first word is, let's say it together, all right, all right. It's not about me. Prayer is not about you. It's not about me. It is about our, it is about the entire world. It is a worldwide prayer. Jesus says, when you go into your room by yourself, pray in a global way. Pray for every single one of the seven point, however many billion people there are on the planet because they need your prayers as much as you need your own prayers. We pray our, and who are these, who is God to these people? Every single one of them, he is Father. They may reject him. They may never have heard of him, but God is Father to all. And so we hope and pray that people will come to understand that God is good, that God has reached out to them as a Father. We understand then that Jesus says, pray, hallowed be your name. I like to translate that to make your name holy. So I'm praying that in this world, that in places like Las Vegas, places like Melba, places in, in India and Africa, places in Russia, I pray that the name of God would be held holy and in high regard, high respect, that when people think of the name of Jesus, they would be encountering the holy. And let's admit it, God's name is not something that's held in high regard often, is it? And the name of Jesus is something that's used casually and even as a curse word. Are we correct? Yes. yes. And so we're praying that that would change. And we have to believe that our prayers are making a difference. We pray your kingdom come, God. So we recognize that we need him to rule. Because when we rule ourselves, it doesn't matter who is leading a nation or any of that. We need God to lead us all. We need his kingdom to come. And we need him to lead us into the goodness that only he has. And we need a heart transplant that his will, his desires, would be done. I think I have some pretty good ideals for the world. I think God has a few better things than me. And so I'm praying that his will would be done. And I'm also praying in that, that I would begin to capture what those things are. That I begin to sense what God's heart is for Melba, for each of you, for us as a church, but for us as a world, for our nation in this time that I would capture God's heart for us. And that's your will be done. That's what we're praying, Lord, what you want, your desires, your heartbeat. Lord, let it be what happens. Provide for our needs. Not just my needs. Not just my, my lunch after church. Not just my roast that's in the crock pot. I don't think anybody has a roast in the crock pot this morning, but somewhere somebody in this world does. <laughs> we're praying that our needs will be provided for. And I'm not just praying for my family's needs. I'm praying for people who will starve today, people who will die of malnourishment today, the, the orphans who have not yet been adopted, we're praying for them today. We're praying for, for not just food 
and water and shelter. We're praying for love and joy. We're praying for hope. We're praying for the bread of life and living water to come into every single person's life. When we pray these things. Do you see this? Lord's Prayer is way more powerful than we often give it credit for. And then we come to the, everybody's favorite part. <laughs> we all love to ask for forgiveness, right? Have you asked for forgiveness in the last 24 hours? I have. Forgive us, but then there's a catch. As we have forgiven others. So we pray this powerful prayer that forgiveness would break through, not just in the lives of everyone, but to break through our own hearts and our hardness and our bitterness towards others, that we would freely forgive as God is willing to so freely forgive us. And then last week we saw, let's say it together, lead us not into temptation. And that's where we finished up last week, lead us not into temptation. And we used some illustrations we use these prominent figures in history, and, and you can name them. There's, there's Abraham Lincoln, there's, uh, there's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there's JFK, Malcolm X, and, and we talked about how they all had one thing in common besides being male leaders, they were all assassinated, yeah. And that was how we started last week, so I thought it went, went over so well and it made you guys so happy to think about assassination. Let's, let's look at something else again. Now when we looked at these other people who had same similar thing in common, also again, all male leaders, and they all were attempted uh, to be assassinated. If people tried to kill them but were unsuccessful, De Gaulle and Louis XV and Castro and Teddy Roosevelt, all these people. And so we looked at these things in Lead Us Not Into Temptation because Lead Us Not Into Temptation is about three main things. It is about leadership. We're asking God to do what God does best, and that is to lead, to lead us. Now, now God is calling you to lead your family, right? But God, you need to follow God to be able to lead your family. It's about rescue. Because the more you understand, lead us not into temptation, you understand how much you need God's help. You need him to constantly be pulling you out of, of the mire and the muck that we find ourselves in. And it is about battle. Lead us not into temptation is about a battle because temptation is not easy to overcome, is it? It is a battle every single day, sometimes every minute of every day, depending on where you're at. Some of you, when you go to work, it is temptation battle all day long. Temptation battle, battle to stay strong, battle to stay faithful to Christ. And so this is a prayer of watchfulness. That I would be, that my eyes would be open to what temptation is around me. It's also a prayer of recognition that God is strong enough to lead me in a way where I don't fall. Because it's also recognition that I am weak and I need his leadership. Understanding of God's strength and of my own weakness. And this is where we finished last week was a statement that I think is, is really important for us as a church and for the capital C church around the world, specifically the church in the United States to hear. And I'm sure all of them will be listening today. We don't know. You never know how far a word will go, do you? But I believe that we need to understand this. Our prayers are greater than our judgments. We're not called to judge the world now. We're not called to judge the world now. We're not called to judge others now. We should never be surprised when a sinner sins now. We should be praying, oh, that the kingdom of God would come. And when we see somebody stuck in sin, when we see somebody broken in sin, when we see a family torn apart, we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Not just ourselves, but those people as well. We cannot underestimate the power of our prayers in the lives of others. I remember a youth two youth that we had years ago and they prayed all the time for their mom to well to get sober because that's all the, that's all that they knew of her was mom who was addicted and they prayed they prayed they prayed and they asked me like well what's the point of praying when god doesn't seem to be changing her and i i, I had to say these words to them and say these words to myself is that that god doesn't force that change but every single time we pray those prayers, it is the whole, giving the Holy Spirit permission, actually asking the Holy Spirit to begin knocking on the door of that person's heart. And our hope is that as we continue to knock on the, person's, uh, the door of that person's heart over and over again, they will answer, that they will give up, that they will yield to the Lord. So let us be powerful in prayer. And so let's take a step away from our, from lead us not into temptation to what comes next. And let me ask you this question. And I think I know the answer. But have you ever been duped? Have you ever been tricked? Think about it for a moment. 
and, and maybe if you have something that comes right to mind, whisper it to your neighbor, or you can say it loud, you can shout it from the rooftops if you want. I've been made full of, this is how it happened. Right, everybody wants to talk to that. Here, here's a story to get you started, then we give you time to share a story of your own on, with your neighbor. Uh, so a kid named Tyler, this is not me being duped, this is somebody else being duped, because those are a whole lot more fun to share. Right? <laughs> We had a youth named Tyler many years ago, and, and we went to Mexico on the mission trip. And, and at the same time we were there on our mission trip with our small group of about 12 of us, there was a group of, of a church, two churches uh, from Oregon, French churches as well, on the same camp, just above us. And there was about 30 to 50 of them. I don't know. There was a lot of them. Now, we would sing some songs around the campfire, but they had guitar and loud drums, and they just rocked out. And they, they blew us away. And then they would do these chants and these yells. And as we're down there trying to have a conversation on a little time, it was kind of, in, kind of intimidating that they were doing that. So we're like, all right, let's just yell and see what happens. So we yelled a couple different things, and they didn't hear us. It's like, well, we need to yell really loud. And so we're like, we need to yell something very unique. And so I spread it around the circle. The Tyler was here, and I spread it around the circle. Um, and kind of like that password game. So we're going we're gonna to pretend that we're all going to yell but nobody yelled. Let's see if Tyler yells this all by himself. And so we set this up, and, and we're like, well, what are we going to yell? What are we going to yell? And somebody said, let's yell, I am a woman. <laughs> and so we're like, oh, that's amazing. That'll surely get their attention. So all right, on three, one, two, three, and Tyler, with all of his heart, yelled at the top of his lungs, I am a woman. <laughs> and I never left. <laughs> I only laughed. And that's what you do as a pastor. <laughs> um, all right, how, how are some times you've been duped, tricked, uh, made a fool of? Any time at all. Just go ahead. And if you don't have anything, look at your neighbor and shrug. You've, you've clearly been more clever than the dupers. <laughs> yeah, Mexico has a lot of trickery that goes on, um, and we'll just leave it there. <laughs> um, have you ever been duped by a purchase? Yeah, we, we bought a Honda, 2008 Honda Pilot a couple of years ago, and everything seemed good, and we got it home, and, and all of a sudden the air conditioning stopped working, so I took it to our friend, the mechanic, he says, well, it's all, the pipes are all rusted out. It's like, why are the pipes rusted? There is significant rust underneath this vehicle. And that thing caused us so many, so many problems, even though we have a warranty. The warranty doesn't cover rust. I don't know if you know that. Uh, have you ever been duped by something in the news? You know, it's like the, the stories, the headlines, now what they do is to get you to click them. They say most of a sentence to build up to the climax, but they don't tell you the point. You know what I'm talking about? There's this, there's this article, and the article was about a dad. Dad rescues four-year-old daughter from large crocodile, or no, sorry, large alligator by dot, dot, dot. I'm like, oh, I gotta know. You wanna know how, if you don't know me very well, you probably would know that I have just a couple fears. One of those is alligators and crocodiles. Because this story was about an 11 foot, seven inch alligator swimming in a canal next to this guy's home and his four year old daughter for some reason was playing by the canal. Now the dad looks out and sees the, the alligator zoom in on his daughter and begin to make a beeline for her in the water. So the dad rescues the daughter. You don't know how the dad rescued the daughter? This is, I'm thinking, oh man, he had to jump on the alligator's back, snatch it out of her jaws, you know, beat it with his fist. You know what he did? Is he ran out, grabbed his daughter, and threw her over the fence. Threw her, threw her, just tossed his daughter over a fence. He didn't know that alligators can climb fences. <laughs> Nothing happened like that. They, well, it took six people to subdue this 11-foot alligator, and, and it had to be taken away. Um, but it was enough to give me nightmares for quite some time. But I thought, you know, this is something that, that seemed like it was going to be this really dramatic story, but it really just came down to a dad tossing his kid over a fence, and that was considered this amazing rescue. Well, I'm glad that the dad did, because that, that could have been worse. As we look at being duped, as we talk about what's coming next, let's read the Lord's Prayer together. 
and see what God has to say to us. Let's, let's pray this as we read this. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's read what Jesus says right after this. <coughs> For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Powerful words. And, and friends, I truly believe that the longer I study this, the longer I've read it, the longer I've prayed it, that these are the greatest prayer requests that a human being can pray. Yes, we can pray for somebody who's sick. Um, we can pray for, for our, our kids. We can pray for a lot of things. But when, when it comes to powerful things we can pray, I believe Jesus lays out some of the most powerful words a human can pray. And here's where we're at today on the to-do list for Jesus. This is how you're going to change the world, church, by prayer. You're going to pray this. You're going to pray, deliver us from evil. You may also see in the translation, deliver us from the evil one. When we talk about the difference between deliver us from evil and the evil one, um, it, it's kind of the, the question of evil within or evil without. The evil that is within all, the temptation to go back to the old ways, which is really what we talked about last week. This week we're talking more about the evil one. And, and we're going to talk about the, the core of, of what the reality of the evil one is. Because Jesus says when you pray, you need to pray that you be delivered from this evil one. So, we saw this last week. In each of the prayers, we assume an identity before the Father. We come to the Father in different ways. And when we pray our Father, we come as a child. And it's really important that we understand that. Because Jesus says that, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to children. We have to come as a child. We have to go back to that innocent place where we just understand we need our Father in heaven. When we come to God and say, how will it be that make your name holy, we're coming in worship. We're recognizing the holiness and the power of his name. We're saying, God, let that be spread throughout the world. When we come and we pray your kingdom, we're coming as a citizen of that kingdom. What a privilege, what an honor to be a part of the kingdom of God. Here and now, though we are here in this building, we also are in the presence of God. It says we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. When we pray, your will be done, Father, we're coming as a servant saying, not me, not what I want, Father, but you, because I believe your heart's bigger and your will is better than mine. Give us this day our daily bread. We come as a beggar, as, as the needy, not just on our own behalf, but on behalf of the entire world, recognizing that we can't make it rain, that we can't make the crops grow, that we can't, you know, demand that our skills exist or that our breath is given to us, that all of the things that we have are from the Father who gives good gifts. Forgive us, then we come as a sinner. We pray forgive us as we forgive others. We come as sinners. And then as we saw last week, when we pray, lead us not into temptation. We come still as a sinner, but one who recognizes that he or she is in danger. A sinner in danger. So when we pray, deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from evil, what are we praying? What is that understanding? When we pray, deliver us from evil, we come as a sinner in danger with the greatest of enemies. Friends, when I ask if we've been duped, been tricked, one of the biggest tricks that exists in our world today is, is the trick that says that Satan isn't real. That demons aren't real. That is a figment of your imagination. That evil does not really exist. That is only based on your interpretation as to whether evil, something is evil or not. Friends, that is a lie. That is a blatant lie. That is something that even Christians are falling for to no longer believe that Satan is a real entity. And so when we pray deliver us from evil, the evil one, we recognize that not only are we a sinner in danger, we have the gravest of enemies. As friends, we said last week, you and I, anyone who bears the name of Jesus Christ, is a target. I wanted to get you little stickers that were bulls out, so you can wear it around with pride. And some people could ask me, like, yeah, I'm a target. Well, that, that, but I didn't. I did bring up these people, the people who had been assassinated. 
and the people who were not assassinated, what do they all have in common besides that they're all male? They're all strong leaders, right? And they are all the targets of other people. I didn't ask the question, I'm gonna ask it today. Which group do you wanna to belong to when your life is over? Do you be one that was assassinated? Or do you wanna be one that it didn't work? And I'm not talking about somebody shooting you with a gun. I'm, asking, I'm talking about spiritual assassination. How many of you want to make it to the end of your lives as a strong follower of Christ? How many of you want to make it to the end of your life having failed miserably and repeatedly to follow Jesus or to, to stand for anything in his kingdom? Friends, every Christian is called to be a leader. Every Christian is called to be a minister. Every Christian is called to serve the Great Commission. Every Christian is called to use their spiritual gifts in the lives of others. So therefore, every Christian is a target. And so we pray, deliver us. And when we pray, deliver us, it looks a lot like this. Deliver us is a lot like coming to God again as a child, a child in need. And so we pray, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. We're praying a prayer of rescue. And we're praying a prayer of protection. We're praying the prayer of a child. And friends, this is a prayer that you need and I need every single day because there's not a day that goes by that you are not a target. There is not a day that goes by that there is not temptation and traps and snares laid out for any believer. Do you understand that? And so when we pray this, we don't just pray it self centeredly We need this prayer as a church. Oh my, do we need this as a church. And maybe now, as much as ever, do we need this as a church. Deliver us, because why? Because there is an enemy who wants to destroy you. And, and this is serious, very, very serious matter. Let me ask this question. If you, got, if you were here this morning and all of a sudden the building erupted in flames, would you be alarmed? Yes. You don't sound alarmed. <laughs> Three of you are like, huh? How big is the fire? Do we have marshmallows and chocolate and graham crackers, Chris? Because that would be handy. If, if, if you walked outside and sharp knives were falling from the sky, would you be, would you be a little distraught? Would you be a bit alarmed? If you went back to the nursery and there was an 11-foot alligator back there climbing over the nursery door trying to get to, to the children back there, would you be a little alarmed? Yes, yes, say it. Yes. Yeah. No, that would, none of those things would be good. None of those things would be good. good. I'm glad that five of you agree with me. <laughs> the enemy of your soul and the enemy of the church is more dangerous than you can think or imagine. You know, the building catching on fire and us losing our lives to being burnt up? Man, that would, that would not be fun. Having sharp knives fall from the sky? I, that sounds really, really painful. Right? Having an alligator, that, that's the worst thing that could happen in the world. You have an alligator within 20 feet of me, especially if it's 11 foot 7 inches. The enemy of our souls is more dangerous than you can think or imagine. Let's see what the scripture has to say. And these are just a few scriptures, and we're going to look at a summary of all the things scripture says. If we spent time reading all this, the descriptions of the evil one, and the Bible take us quite some time, so rather... Afterwards, if you want a link, I can send you a link to a wonderful resource that has a powerful study, Bible-wide, about the evil one. And let's look at this for now. These are some of the most powerful passages for me. And I think you have them in your sermon notes. First Peter says this. Let's read it together. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stop. Building on fire, knives falling from the sky, alligator in the nursery. Your enemy is like a lion and he's looking for someone to devour. Have you ever seen a lion devour an animal? It is not pleasant. Watching it chase it down, grab it from the backside, tear it down, grab its throat, and try to just rip into it. It's not a good thing. And that's what the Bible says Satan is out doing. He's looking for someone to devour. Verse 9. Resist him, 
standing firm in the faith because you know that your fellow believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. The enemy is out for you and out for every other believer. John 10.10, 10, one of the simplest verses you could memorize, and, and yet one of the most efficient at just conveying in a real quick sense why we need to be on alert. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Which of those two options would you like to have? To have things stolen from you, to be killed and destroyed, not just killed, but destroyed, or have life to the fullest. Jesus lays it right before us, right there. He says also in John 8, you belong to your father, the devil. He's speaking to the Jews who are, who are against him and trying to set up uh, his arrest and murder. And he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. Why? For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Friends, the enemy of your soul is more dangerous than you think. He is called a thief, a lion, a deceiver. He is an accuser. Repeatedly in the Bible, he is called an accuser or an adversary. He is the destroyer, the adversary, the slanderer. He is the father of lies, he is a murderer, and he is a tempter. He is the prince of the power of the air, and he is someone who is a trapper. He is the ruler of this broken world, and he is a hunter seeking after people to devour. He has a kingdom, did you know that? The devil has a kingdom. And he preys on our weaknesses. He works effectively by offering counterfeits and shortcuts to what God wants us to experience. When you think for a moment, I mentioned Vegas earlier, when you think for a moment all that Vegas seems to have to offer people and why people go there, when you think of all the things that it has to offer, do you not realize all those things are counterfeits and shortcuts to what God really wants to give? God wants to give life. God wants us to find life and love and joy in Him. And yet Satan offers shortcuts and counterfeits at a great cost. We pray. And I pray. Deliver us. Deliver us. Again, this is a prayer of rescue. This is a prayer of protection. And it is a prayer of a child. Do you remember when you were a kid and you cried out for mom or dad or whoever because you were scared at night and you needed somebody to come in and turn on the light? I do. I'm not ashamed to say that. It was often. I don't know how my parents slept. How much more do we need real protection from the enemy of our souls? How much do we need to pray this over the youth and our kids? Do we see any evidence that our youth are being attacked or tempted at all? The church needs to pray this prayer with passion and power because the enemy wants to do a couple things. We've listed them. Here's some things that I believe the enemy is trying to do in every Christian's life today, especially in the United States, in our lives. I'm not going to be surprised if any of these are true. The enemy wants to keep you busy. If you're too busy, then you don't have time for prayer. If you're too busy, you don't have time for God's Word. If you're too busy, you don't have time for worship. If you're too busy, you don't have time to share about Him to other people. If you're too busy... You simply forget. You go to bed and say, I'll do better tomorrow. You know what happens tomorrow night. The same thing. The enemy wants to keep Christians as busy as possible and entertained as possible. Satan wants to make you mediocre. A mediocre Christian is really of no threat to the enemy's kingdom. A mediocre Christian is of no threat to the enemy's kingdom. A mediocre Christian doesn't have much to say and doesn't really think that they should say much. Satan wants you to be mediocre in your faith. He does not want you to pray world-changing prayers. He does not want you to say world-changing things. He does not want you to love in a world-changing way. Satan also wants to take your testimony. He wants to shut you up. How does he do that? Get you to compromise. Get you to fall for his temptation. Whatever it may be, get you to the point where you feel like even though you should say something, 
you're really not worthy. If Satan can shut Christians up for testifying not about politics or anything like that, but testifying about the redemption that they have received through Jesus Christ and the resurrection and the renewal of all things that is coming, if he can get us to shut up about those things, then what difference does it make if we talk? Ultimately, Satan would love to destroy your faith. He's happy with any of those options. Happy with any of those options. If he can get the majority of Christians to, to, be, to fall into one of these categories, then, then he can have his way. Because if we fall into these categories, then we stop praying compassionate, world-changing prayers, and we stop living, living passionate lives for Jesus. And granted, friends, I know we all struggle, and we're all part of the battle. This is why we're talking about first steps and growing up, because we're supposed to keep growing. You may say, I've been a Christian for 20 years, and I still feel like a toddler falling down, running into the table. Yeah, okay. But keep growing. Keep taking the steps. Keep following out these things. The enemy wants to do these things, and how then are we to pray? When you pray this, who are we to pray for? Oh. oh, which means who? who? Who are we to pray deliver us from the evil one for? Anybody know? I've only said it like every Sunday for about seven months. Who are we to pray for when we pray the Lord's Prayer? Every single person on the planet. If you question whether or not there's an evil one or there's evil, then, then go to some of the darkest places in the world and spend some time there looking Spend some time in some of the most impoverished areas and see what happens there. Go to some of the richest areas and see what happens there under secret. Our world is under attack. And that the one who was the aggressor is the enemy. So when we say this, we're praying this for the entire world because Satan wants the entire world, the entire church, capital C, across the world, in Rwanda, in Ireland, in, in Asia, in, in Russia, and in America. He wants to keep us busy, make us mediocre, take our testimony, and destroy our faith. And unfortunately, friends, to some degrees, he's been very successful. Like Chris, this is the most encouraging sermon I've ever heard. Let's go back to the fire of knives and alligators because those are a little more cheerful. <laughs> Let's ask the question, what can we do, church? What can we do? How do we, how do we overcome the enemy? Good news, the Bible tells us how. Did you know that? The Bible, the Bible doesn't just say, yeah, you'll figure it out. The Bible tells us how and it gives us some clear things. I love these things. I remember preaching this one of the uh, first sermons in the first couple of years I preached. I had somebody that came up and continues to talk about how hearing these things, they're not from me, they're from the scriptures. That's why it's effective. To hear these things because this helped this person out of a situation where they could not escape the evil that was around them. What can you do? Here's some things you can do. Good news is most of them start with the letter R. Just conveniently. First thing you can do, let's say it together, you can read. We're not talking about just read anything. Read what? God's word. Read what? And let's uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 one of the most powerful verses about God's word says this, read it with me for the word of God is alive and active, say it again the word of God is alive and active it is sharper than any double edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirits joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, friends there could be sharp knives falling from the sky but if the word of God is going into people's lives it is way more effective way more transformative. Reading the Word of God is one of the best things we can do because it makes us aware of God's intentions for us and it also makes us aware of the enemy's plans for us. And when you see those things, it is easier to move forward and choose well. What else can we do? We can remember and proclaim. Remember and proclaim. I found this thing to be one of the, it really is so incredibly powerful. I don't talk about it enough. I should. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 say this. Would you read it with me? Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. And in verse 20, you were bought at a price. Friends, there is one thing that Satan does not want to hear from you at all. And that is that I belong to Jesus. He bought me with his precious blood. 
He died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and saved. And he rose from the dead so that I could look forward to rising from the dead myself because I am going to be with him forever because he paid for me. I belong to him. Satan hates those words. He does not want to hear your testimony. If you are confronted with evil, your testimony is one of the most powerful things. You know what? It has so very little to do with you. It has everything to do with what God has done for you through Jesus. And that is something that shatters the power of the enemy. It already has, and when we remind Satan, and we proclaim that we are bought by the blood of Christ, how powerful and effective that is for our strength and for the enemy. If you wake in the middle of the night and you sense the presence of evil in your home, then get up and proclaim, no, this place belongs to the Lord because we've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. What else can you do? We can resist. Sounds simple. You can resist. How do we resist? Well, James says this, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It sounds so simple. How do we resist the devil? Well, we deliberately choose to turn to Jesus instead of what Satan offers. Deliberately choose to turn to Jesus instead of what Satan offers. So when Satan offers a snare, when he offers a counterfeit, when he offers a shortcut to, to what you think you want, deliberately resisting that and turning to Jesus, saying, God, you know the desires of my heart and you know how to best meet those things. Would you please meet me here and now as I resist the temptation that comes on me? Resisting. And the last one is something that might surprise you. Some people may disagree, but you can run. You can run. And this was something that I shared that, that, uh, that God used to change uh, a, young, uh, a young mom's life. Um, it caused her to, to run away from her, the workplace because it was a place of evil. It was a place of struggle. It was a battle that was greater than her strength to, to overcome. And so when she heard this, she realized there are some traps and some snares that we're not meant to walk through. Sometimes we need to run the opposite way. And sometimes, friends, we have a tendency of wandering into temptation, don't we? And, and uh, social media, internet, technology doesn't help us at all. Second Timothy says this, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Run away from sin. Run away from temptation. If it feels like the battle is too strong, run away from that and run into the arms of your Father. How do you do that? You do that in prayer. Many years ago, our family uh, was down in Southern California. We flew into LAX. My mom was with us. And uh, we, were, we, were, we got off a shuttle, uh, I believe from a hotel or, or something like that. Maybe it was a taxi. And we got out in the busy L entrance to LAX. And so several things are happening at the same time. One, we're trying to unload our luggage. Two, we're trying to figure out where in the world we're supposed to go. LAX is bigger than Melbourne. <laughs> it has a little bit more traffic. There were cars flying by, buses and all these things, people yelling and honking. It's just a glorious place to relax. <laughs> but we're there, and, and as we're, we're getting things out, I'm trying to get the bags out of the shuttle I'm trying to get them on the sidewalk, and everybody else is trying to keep things in order. Uh, and, and the problem is, is we all think somebody else is watching Ethan. And it is at a moment where I'm grabbing a bag that I realize none of us were, and he's about, I mean, he is, he is, he is here to here into massive high-speed traffic. As a good dad, what do you think I did? Mm -hmm. What do you think I did? Right. Yeah. I grabbed him. I grabbed his arm and yanked him back. How concerned was I about our bags at that time? Not at all. Not at all. When we pray this prayer, what does it mean to pray deliver? Deliver actually means snatch us. Drag us away. Drag us away. We realize when we pray this prayer, we are asking God to grab us by the scruff of the neck, grab our arm and yank it out of socket if he has to, to rescue us, to pull us out of the way of the oncoming evil that is coming to destroy us. 
Friends, how powerful this prayer is. How good this prayer is. And how good it is that we have a Father who can't wait to rescue us every single day from evil. He wants us to pray this, not just for ourselves, but for the entire world, because he wants to drive us away. He's not going to force us to do it, but when we pray it, we are empowering the kingdom of God in the lives of ourselves and the lives of others to do exactly that. And friends, the world needs the church to pray, deliver us from evil. Friends, we cannot miss the point on this. The church, we must not miss the point. We must be careful to not fall into the same snares and traps that, God, that, that the enemy, sorry, that the enemy, the evil one, sets for individuals. We must not be distracted as a church. We must not be misdirected as a church. We must not be fighting the wrong battles. We must, be, we must not be missing the Savior. There is one Savior. There is one who can rescue. There is one who can forgive. And we know that one. That is Jesus. And we cannot miss him because we're so focused on everything else in this world. And believe me, this world is trying really, really, really hard to distract the church because when the church gets distracted, you know what happens? It gets discredited. Because all of a sudden it's talking about stuff that isn't the main thing. People need to hear about Jesus and your testimony that he has saved you more than they need to hear your opinion on a whole lot of other things. And that's the church speaking. The church needs to be that way. And I, as a pastor, need to make sure very careful. If I ever, if you ever see me publicly speaking about something and stirring up things that are not of the kingdom, then you should rebuke me. You should correct me. Hopefully lovingly. Hopefully nicely. I'm trying to be nice to you. Be nice to me. But we're all tempted. We're all distracted. We're all misdirected. We've got to be very, very careful. We cannot miss it, friends. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. I said it's one of my favorite chapters because it has the armor of God in it. And friends, there's few things you can pray over yourself that are more powerful than the armor of God. The Lord's Prayer is one, but then I think the armor of God is the second. Finally, let's pray it together. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil has schemes. He has plans for you. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Say it again. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. One more time and actually think about it. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Heavenly realms. Heavenly realms. Not the earthly realms. The spiritual battle that's going on is where our battle is at, not in the flesh and blood. Right? With me? Amen? Amen. Let's, let's fight that battle. Because if we win that battle, the people get saved. If we win the flesh and blood battle, people get hurt. Do not miss it. Do not miss the fact that there's a war. Do not miss the purpose. Do not miss the battles. Do not miss the salvation and where it comes from. Do not miss the Savior. Do not miss coming to the Father as a child. Friends, it, it's, a, it's a sermon that is to be, oh, it's almost an introductory. This is a lifelong thing, and it's a lifelong growth process. Um, we need to understand that this is a big, big prayer that we can pray. It's something that we need to grow in as a church. I believe as we do, we will see some of the strongholds that the enemy has, even in our own community, that we may not even know exist. We will see them fall apart. If we pray big, if we pray, deliver us from the evil one. And man, I want to see those strongholds of the enemy in the world broken down. I want to see those things happen. There are other things I'd love to see happen in this world, but I want to see God triumphantly bring his kingdom into the lives of those around us. Are you with me? These are first steps, friends. In our world, in our church, in our home, in our own lives, deliver us from evil. These are first steps, friends. Let us pray these things, and let's pray this now. Father in heaven, we love you and we praise you that we are gathered here today knowing that we can be your church only because of what you've done for each of us through Jesus Christ. And we say, Lord, we've been purchased by you. And so therefore, we are yours. And Lord, you didn't get a very good deal when you bought us. But thank you that you haven't given up on us and you're growing us. Father, we pray for our world. 
We pray that you would deliver it from evil, from the evil one. We pray for our country, that you would deliver it from the evil one. We pray for our state. We pray for Melba. We pray for the Treasure Valley. We pray for our community, our church. We pray for everyone here. We pray for the church abroad, that you would deliver us from the evil one, Lord. Do not let him be successful in stealing, killing, destroying, or devouring us. Only you, Father, are great enough. And only you, Father, are strong enough to see us through. So in the same way, Lord, that you led your people through the desert, you led them through a sea, you led them through and out of a place of slavery, Lord, lead us into victory over the enemy. Help us to have these words ingrained in our minds and hearts to pray on a daily basis, Lord, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done, that you would provide for our needs, that your name would be holy throughout the earth, that you would forgive all of us, and that we would forgive others, that you would lead us, Lord, not into the path of temptation, but you would deliver us from this evil one. Because, God, we want to be yours in the end. And we want to arrive triumphantly at the doorstep of the kingdom of heaven in its fullness. We pray this in the holy and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We all say, Amen. Amen.